This is a picture of a photovoltaic array that is also part of a carport located on the Penn State campus. On the right, you can see a cable that is part of an electric vehicle charging station. The carport is next to the Morningstar Solar House on Porter Road near Medler Field. In this video, we will discuss some features of this array. The array has 24 Sanyo bifacial photovoltaic modules. This is a unique type of module that can accept sunlight from the top and also from the bottom of the module. To our knowledge, this is the only module on the market that can do this. The idea is that the pavement underneath the array can reflect some of the sunlight and the modules can catch it, in addition to the sunlight hitting the top of the array. These are architecture drawings of the carport. We have a top view, a front view, and two side views. We are going to concentrate on this top view. Looking at the top view more closely, we see that the structure was designed for the modules to be mounted in four rows and six columns with the modules in the landscape orientation. This is a picture of one module taken from the spec sheet. The little black rectangle here near the top is the junction box for the module. A positive and a negative wire come out of the junction box on the back side of the module with connectors at the end so that the positive wire from one module can only be connected to the negative wire of another module. To get the total array voltage that we wanted, we decided to wire the array electrically with six modules in each string and four parallel strings. This happens to be similar to the four rows and six columns in the mounting configuration, but in many arrays this is not the case. The question was which modules to connect together for each string. One possibility is to mount all of the modules with the junction boxes at the top. Then we would wire them across the rows of modules like this. The problem with this idea was that all of the strings of modules had to be wired into a large box near the middle of the array. So to wire all of the modules to the middle would have required all of this wire. The long wires pointed out here would have been difficult to position and secure with the mounting structure we had. Fortunately, we saw this problem before the modules had actually been mounted. We were able to have the modules in the first and third rows mounted rotated 180 degrees, putting their junction boxes at the bottom as shown here. Meanwhile, the second and fourth rows were mounted so that their junction boxes were at the top as before. Then we could wire a string of modules with the six modules at the top left, as shown here. Another string could be wired with the six modules at the top right. The other two strings could be wired here and here. This configuration requires much less wire than the other one. It also eliminated the wires that were most difficult to position and secure. From the box in the middle, the wires then continued down from the canopy to underground and from there to the nearby solar house. Now let's talk a little about individual modules. We see in this picture that each module has 8 columns of solar cells, with 12 solar cells in each column. With 8 columns of 12 cells each, we have a total of 96 cells. The spec sheet tells us that the open circuit voltage of a module is 68.7 volts. If we divide 68.7 by 96, we get 0.72 volt. This is actually rather high. Modules made with normal silicone solar cells have an open circuit voltage of only about 0.6 volts per cell in series. These cells are a special type called HIT cells, which are made only by Sanyo and have a higher voltage. With normal silicone cells, if you divide the module's open circuit voltage by the number of cells in the module, you normally get about 0.6 volt, which tells you that all the cells are required in series. If you only get about 0.3 volt, it means that the cells are wired in two parallel strings of cells. But we still conclude from this calculation that all 96 solar cells in the module must be wired in series. Otherwise, the open circuit voltage divided by the number of cells would have been 0.36 volt or less. The spec sheet also tells us that there are four bypass diodes in a module. They must be in the junction box because we would see them any other place. How are these wired? We can see some of the internal metal wires here at the top. It must be that each pair of columns is wired as shown here, 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 and here. 
All these wires are brought into the junction box and then inside of the junction box the strings and cells were connected in series like this, this, and this. So we now have all 96 cells in series. Then the bypass diodes are placed among groups of columns here, 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 and here. Each diode bypasses 24 cells in a pair of columns. And then of course there are the leads going out of the junction box. Here is an IV curve for the module. We can see here the open circuit voltage is about 67 volts and the short circuit current is about 3.75 amps. The maximum power point of the module is someplace around here with the product of the current and the voltage is maximum. On this graph the blue line shows the IV curve of one module. The red line shows the IV curve of six modules in series. All of the voltages for the blue line are multiplied by 6 to give the red line, while the currents remain the same. Now we put four strings in parallel. We get an IV curve for the entire array shown as the green line here. To get this, we start with the IV curve of a single module, the blue line. Then we multiply the voltages by 6 for the six modules in each string. Now we put four of these strings in parallel, and we get an IV curve for the entire array shown as the green line here. The entire array has a short circuit current for about 15 amps and an open circuit voltage for the array of about 375 volts. Now let's go back here and think about what would happen if there is a problem with the array. Let's suppose there is a broken wire so the array is running on just 18 modules. Instead of having an IV curve like this top green line here for four strings in parallel, we would only have the purple line for three strings in parallel since the total current would only be three times the current of one string. So if we measure the current while the system is working and we would see that the current is this much lower than it should be. This would be a clue that one of the strings is not putting out any current and we would look around to try to find the problem. Please notice that the open circuit voltage will be the same for three strings as for four although the array's output power would be less. Fortunately, this kind of problem will not occur too often. A more likely problem is that one cell in only one module would stop working. Then, no current would be able to flow through that cell or any of the other cells in that bad cells column or the one on its left. The current could only go through the diode at the top right, bypassing 24 cells in the module's top rightmost columns. This module would then only have 72 cells working instead of 96. The IV curve for the broken module will look something like the green line. Then we will have three strings of modules having IV curve like the red line and our fourth string will be a little different. It will fall a little more quickly like the green line. With one bad cell, the IV curve will not change a lot, as is shown in purple and it will be difficult to detect. The advantage of having a bypass diode is that it will allow the other cells to work when there's a bad cell. The disadvantage is that it makes it hard to know that something is wrong and to look for the problem.